thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us, Lord, and the opportunity to come into your house and worship and learn about you. And Lord, we just praise you in advance for the message you have laid on Brother Matt's heart for us to hear today, Lord. And I know that it will be so effective and so loving, and that we can just take that message out these doors and do your will. And Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you blessed us with. Lord, just, um, we just can't thank you enough. And it's through your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So so much of the stuff that Evelyn has and for home and that they're doing. So if you're not part of that, we certainly enjoy doing it. Got a text message right after I got here this morning. Kathy Sullivan said she woke up with a horrible, horrible cough. 
and this wasn't anything to do. She said her inhaler, nothing seemed to work. Uh, so she did, said she didn't want to come and disrupt the service. But anyway, be praying for Kathy uh, as she is uh, not feeling well today. Uh, also, we found out just recently that Micah Dorothy's daughter, Wendy, uh, had a biopsy done in the middle of her chest, and the biopsy came back empty. So please pray for Wendy Miller, uh, their daughter down in Florida. Uh, Jim, uh, glad, to, glad to have Jim back, and, and he, is, he is doing so much better. And Dave, another thing that's going on today, Jim, Remember what that might be? After how many years with the county? 22 and a half. Wow. Today is officially Jim's retirement. Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations. He said the county, the county absolutely forbids him going back into the building and helping people. I said, well, uh, get ready with your phone. May not have to be able to go in, but I said, your phones will be ringing off the hook. Jim, you're going to be very, very, very difficult to replace. Um, talk with Bill. Bill's about the same. He's got some more tennis. Uh, today we're reading from Colossians 2, verses, 4, verses 9 and 10. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power.
Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you today. Just uh, wanted to say a couple words here again. I have that buddy. <laughs> so, uh, so somebody in Africa is watching the videos. They're going, "Who's that Yahoo in the background?" <laughs> it's like it's funny. That's, that's who it is. There's some books on the table back there. Please take some home, clean it out. So I don't have to take any books back. And uh, don't ever bring them back. There's, inside the cover, there's a little stamp that says "Pass the blessing" and it says it has to sign and date it and pass it on to someone else. So don't bring it back here, give it to a friend or family member or, or something like that. So please do that, take some books. Um, we'll start today with our series in Colossians. Uh, Complete in Christ is the theme we'll consider. We're all pragmatic. Uh, I find myself becoming more pragmatic the older I get. Uh, I'm told that's common as a person ages. Um, What's pragmatism? Well, let me illustrate it with the three most useful tools in every handyman's toolbox. A can of WD-40, a roll of duct tape, and a hammer. If it doesn't move but should, you use WD-40. If it moves but shouldn't, you use duct tape. If it, either of those don't work, you use the hammer for the percussive maintenance. <laughs> There's a website that I follow that posts pictures of goofy fixes that people make with duct tape. Uh, one picture showed a car door made of duct tape. Uh, someone uh, else was missing a headlight, so they duct taped a flashlight into the hole where the headlight would be. Well, one of the duct tape's other nicknames is called 95 mile an hour tape. An airline literally put that to the test as a passenger took a picture of duct tape on a flap on an airliner in mid flight. <laughs> now we laugh at these things because most of us have done something not too far removed. Uh, we, we did what we needed to do to get the job done. Uh, never mind that it wasn't done right. It, it was just good enough to get by. We went by the adage, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. Uh, it's pragmatic. Sometimes we use a similar approach to life. Uh, do what you need to do just to get by. Uh, we, we make snap decisions when we're faced with great difficulty. Uh, we, we react wrongly when, when hurt by someone else. Uh, we, we make decisions without ever thinking if it was the right one. We, we just make the decision, and, and God only comes into the picture after the fact when we expect him to bless our willfulness. I once spoke with a man facing a life dominating problem. Uh, several of his relatives, believers, uh, even leaders in their churches, a church not like her, uh, not unlike our own, uh, the man related how his relatives responded to his situation with the grossest kind of unbelief. They said things that, and expected decisions to be made that were expedient, doing what was necessary to get by, but not by any means based in faith in God's word or a reliance upon God's grace. Their actions revealed a troubling issue. You would have to conclude that Christ is great for Sunday mornings or in an immediate crisis, but when the rubber meets the road, Christ just makes you feel good on Sundays. Faith apparently doesn't mean much beyond that. Christ really doesn't make a difference in a person's life. Christ really can't sustain a person. Christ doesn't really offer lasting hope and joy. Christ is just a, a caricature of an icon in our songs. Let me put it in another way. We have to conclude that Christ is not enough. We rely on what we think of the needs of the moment. We call them situation ethics. We must necessarily conclude that following Christ really doesn't work. And we reason in effect that we can jettison the inconvenient things in the Bible, and we won't really have to love mercy and walk humbly. And, and when those things are removed, we just muddle through somehow. That's pragmatism. Someone defined pragmatism as a form of relativism that, that holds any belief is youth that is useful is true, and any truth that's inconvenient is necessarily untrue. What works for me right now is the best thing to do. 
And a corollary of that is what is true is not what's true for you is not true for me. I'm going to live my truth. Pragmatism is the underlying premise of our culture, and it's crept its way into the lives of believers. Right. Now, the culture in Paul's day reflected our modern culture. Many lived according to their own personal creed, uh, whatever that might have been. Uh, people do the same thing today. Uh, they see things like this. Whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. No, it just doesn't kill you. <laughs> do something today that your future self will thank you for. Uh, the happiest people don't have the best of everything, they just make the best of everything. Uh, your best teacher is your last mistake. Stop waiting for things to happen, go out and make them happen. Now these are undoubtedly inspiring quotes, but one thing makes them common. If you just trust yourself to be yourself, you'll come out all right. Put a bunch of these inspirational quotes together and you can tackle anything in life. Believers do the same thing, but they just do it with badly misquoted Bible verses. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Uh, ask and it will be given. All things work for good. And we put verses like these on knickknacks and sell them for outrageous prices at Christian gift shops. And, and if we just tell ourselves often enough that I can do all things, well, I can do anything I set my mind to because I'm a Christian. The Bible becomes a spiritual WD-40 or a roll of duct tape to help me get by. In other words, we use the Bible pragmatically. Paul teaches us in no uncertain terms that Christ is enough. <coughs> Not just a name that when we repeat it often enough, he becomes this magical genie springing out of our Bibles to fix our situations and give us whatever we want. Christ is the creator and sustainer of the universe. Uh, he, he's the redeemer and savior of mankind. We cannot use him however we please. Christ fills everything and takes first place above everything. And Paul gives us this message in the book of Colossians. So let's start with a few basic questions about this book. Who, who is the author and the audience here this morning? Well, the apostle Paul wrote the letter to from prison to the church at Colossae. Around somewhere around 6080, uh, not too far distant from the book of Ephesians. He wrote to a church most likely planted by his friend Epaphras. We, we don't even have a record that, that Paul ever visited this church of Colossae. Uh, even though Paul had no apparent direct connection with the church, he showed great concern for them. Colossae in modern day Turkey was a Gentile area with a significant Jewish population. Jews migrated to the area during the period between the Testaments, and, and as we'll see in a few moments, Paul addresses both the Jews and the Gentiles in this letter. So what did Paul write to the Colossian church? What's the basic content of Colossians? We'll summarize the chapters here very briefly, starting with chapter 1. Paul immediately begins with the doctrine of Christ. Verse 17 of chapter 1 tells us Christ's supreme importance. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Christ is before everything in leadership, in, in, in importance, in, in every way possible. How can Christ be so free? Well, verse 19 says, For it pleased the Father that in Christ all fullness dwell. Christ is God. Christ isn't just the son of God, a, a demigod, or a lesser god like Hercules, or Achilles, or, or Superman. Christ possesses all the divinity that the Father and the Spirit possess. There are none greater than Christ. Amen. The absolute deity of Christ makes verse 22 so wonderful. In the body of his, Christ flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in the Father's sight. God became flesh and died in our place just so that we could be with him. No other God in human mythology ever did any such thing. Christ truly holds first place in everything. Christ is supreme. And we move to chapter 2, and, and Paul applies the supremacy of Christ to worldviews in, in, this, verse, in this chapter. Verse 8 says, Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. A philosophy is basically a way to explain our existence, the way we live, how we live. 
we all have a philosophy of life. Even to claim that you don't have a philosophy of life is a pragmatic way to say, I won't concern myself with the details, I'll just do what I need to do to get by. Every worldview apart from Christ can be summarized as a man-made tradition, leaving us incomplete and dissatisfied. Paul addresses one view, worldview which considers Christ to be something less than God, starting in verses 9 and 10. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Paul states emphatically that Christ is God, which means that he possesses the absolute authority over all, the, the universe, the church, even your life. And Paul unmasks an errant worldview among believers. Verse 11 says, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision, made without hands, in putting off the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And using the matter of circumcision, a very important matter to Jews, to Jewish believers, Paul teaches that we must not substitute biblical rituals or spiritual traditions for Christ. In chapter 3, Paul explains the ethical implications of Christ's supremacy. The opening verses of the chapter read, If you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Because Christ reigns supremely, we must make him our ultimate priority. We must design our lives around fellowship with him. Now what does this life look like? Uh, Paul explains in verses 12 and 13. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. A right relationship with God works its way into our relationships with the people around us. We will relate to each other with compassion, humility, forgiveness, because Christ set that pattern for us. In verses 18 to chapter 4, verse 1, Paul addresses the most basic relationships in life. Spouse, children, employee, employer. Christ reigns supreme over, over nature, over his church, and over every relationship we could ever have. And the final chapter teaches us how Christ's supremacy impacts our testimony, our witness. Verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. We have a couple of sayings that illustrate this verse well. Talk is cheap. Your actions speak louder than your words. How a person talks reveals what they are even when they speak at the critical. On the other hand, Christ will impact our lives in such a way that our words back up our lives. Now that we've considered the book's audience and contents, we ask ourselves the question, why? Why did this, why was this book written? Well, this is where we get down to the text that was read earlier this morning, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ dwell all the fullness of the God and bodily. And you are complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Short and simple, we could summarize the, the book into this sentence. Christ is more than enough. Christ is more. Be supreme. Have you ever just reached a point where you said, you know, it doesn't matter? I, I don't care anymore. I, I think we've all reached that point at, at some time or another. We, we just got bored or tired or frustrated and sometimes all three. And it's at these times when we're most pra pragmatic, just do whatever you need to do to get by. Is life really just a matter of muddling through something? Isn't there more to life than just barely coping with it? Does it matter that Christ is supreme and first place and all that? Well, let's consider the names of Christ and Colossians. We're going to do very quickly here. In chapter 111, he's the strengthener. Chapter 1, verse 13, he's the rescuer. Verse 14, he's the redeemer. Verse 14, he's the forgiver. Verse 16, the creator. Verse 17, the sustainer. 
the leader in verse 18, the reconciler in verse 20, the peacemaker in verse 20, the presenter in verse 22, the hope giver in verse 27, the treasurer in chapter 2, verse 3, the completer in chapter 2, verse 10, the ruler in chapter 2, verse 10, the resurrector in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, the canceler in verse 14, the victor in verse 15, the liver, the one who is alive in chapter 3. Why does it matter that Christ holds first place in everything, giving the significance, the, giving significance to everything? Well, think for a moment about the importance of, of Christ's complete deity. If Christ is not completely God, then is, he's an imperfect being. His death becomes a noble yet futile attempt to bring peace to the world to people with whom he never can and never will relate and identify. Faith in Christ must also no longer be necessary for salvation, and we must rely on our own man-made morality, such as a collection of inspirational quotes that provide general guidance for our lives. If Christ's death was nothing more than a noble sacrifice, sin doesn't really matter. We may sin, we may do good, however we define either. We're not accountable for how we live, which also means that, that we're no longer guilty because there's nothing from which to be redeemed. And if there's nothing from which to be redeemed, any self-discipline or self-control becomes nothing more than asceticism, a, a self-infliction of pain and suffering for no apparent reason. Touch not, taste not, handle not in verse 21 uh, are, are just ways one person tries to control another. So what do we do with this? A while ago, I was in a situation where I came up with what I thought was a brilliant idea. I mean, it was almost the best thing since, like, almost. Uh, a few weeks later, someone else I was working with took the credit for the project that sprang from that idea. And I was a little bit at first. I, I wanted to get others to know it was my idea. It was my brilliance. It was all about me. I wanted the credit. I wanted the glory. And as I look, look back on it, it, it was silly. In, in the grand scheme of things, to this day, this was several years ago now, no one remembers whose idea it was. It, it was a good idea, but the sudden flash of brilliance ahead was actually more like the, the sudden flash of a light bulb as it expires. You know? Ask the question, who gets the credit? Who gets the glory for your life? You might say about a wealthy man, he's a self-made man. And what we mean is that he didn't inherit anything, he worked for everything he got. We not, may not be wealthy, but I say that I, I dare say that on a practical level, we consider ourselves self-made. We work hard for where we are in life. We work hard for where we are in our walk of faith. We deserve a little respect. The psalmist said, Know you that the Lord he is God. It is He that made us and not we ourselves. Pray that Christ made us who we are by His grace. He is indeed supreme, which means that He is worthy of all honor and glory. How do I give Christ the glory that He's due? Well, first, pray it. Christ said the pattern for our. our for us in the Lord's grace, that our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed simply means holy, revered, respected above all else. When we pray, we must communicate our adoration for Christ. Jesus, I praise you because you died on the cross. I praise you because of your mercy and grace. Second, we need to say it. Tell the people in your life what Christ did for you. Maybe, maybe God protected you in a dangerous situation. Maybe, maybe he provided a need that you had. Maybe God answered a prayer that you've been praying for a long time. As we, we heard the day about John, what a wonderful, what a wonderful news. Whatever it is that can only be explained God by God's grace, tell others about it. Third, display it. It's one thing to praise God in a personal, private prayer. It's one thing to tell people that Christ did something special for them. It's another thing to live a life that's ruled by Christ. Make Christ your prayer. <clears throat> Chapter 3 begins, if you then be risen with Christ, if you're a believer, 
Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. If you looked at the Bible concordance, you discover that the word translated keep seeking could also be translated keep plotting. Plot or plan your life so that Christ is your first and ultimate priority. Plan your day around it. Say, I, I will protect my fellowship with Christ today. Design your life around Christ. Don't just fit him in wherever it's convenient. Make Christ the king of your thoughts, your desires, your attitudes, your motives, your actions, your words. Anything less is not setting our affections on things above. Christ holds first place in everything. Is that true in your life? <clears throat> See also Christ is enough. Uh, have you ever opened up a put it together to, uh, together yourself kit from you know IKEA or Walmart yeah. or something like that? Maybe you spent time on Christmas Eve trying to put together one of your children's or grandchildren's Christmas kits. Most of us have probably done one of these DIY assembly kits at some point or another. In one of those times, did you ever discover that you were missing a crucial piece? You know, a bolt or a flange or sprocket, whatever. You didn't have enough to get by. Here's another scenario. Maybe you were cooking and you didn't have enough of a certain ingredient. I, I ran into this on occasion, and in your experience, I've learned either to substitute or experiment or sometimes just to do without. But in both situations, you, you didn't have enough. Christ is enough. He, he's more than enough. We read in chapter 1, verse 18, that Christ holds for his place in everything. We read in chapter 3, verse 11, that Christ is all and in all. Christ fills everything. How does he do this for us? Look at chapter 2. With and you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened and he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. At the moment we placed our faith in Christ, he made us alive spiritually. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Christ canceled our debt. You pay off a mortgage. Bank stamps on the paper, paid in full. We believe in Christ for salvation. It was as if he took a stamp that said, paid in full, to the list of our crimes against God's holy God. Jesus paid Verse 15. Having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Christ conquered our enemies, which were sin, death, and the devil. His victory was not one that was ever in hell. It was a complete and total domination in which the contest was never truly in question. So, what do we do with that? Well, sometimes life gets difficult. Things don't go as we expect or as we plan. Things blow up, uh, blow us out of the water. So it does something that surprises or hurts us. Sometimes thoughtful, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes spitefully. We respond immediately. And usually we, we try to return things to the way they were a short while ago. We, we do whatever we think we need to do to make life work. We become pragmatic. We act as if Christ isn't enough. Yes, Christ commanded good guidance for life. The chips are down. Going gets tough. We just have the command because they just aren't convenient. Christ and his word apparently aren't enough. They're good for Sunday, but the rest of the week, well, not so much. We'll follow God as long as his love leads us to blessing. When God's love leads us through hardship and pain, we cease to build the Christ of worship. What do we do when life changes? What do we do when problems arise? The answer begins before life becomes difficult. Look at chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. That the word of Christ, the Bible, the scriptures dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, 
whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We must allow Christ's word to, to dwell, to live in us. What does that mean? The Bible isn't like every other book. You, you don't just pick it up and read it from cover to cover and then say, well, I, I know what's in the Bible. No man thought just like this. He read the Bible from cover to cover. It was inconceivable to him that he ever needed to read the Bible again. The Bible isn't some true historical novel. It's the living word that cuts to the heart of everything we are, everything we do, everything we say. It possesses the power to give life. Jeremiah tells us God's word breaks rocks and pieces. Think of the situation in your life that just won't change. It's horrible. It's terrible. It just seems to go on and on with no end in sight. It seems to make you hard toward life, or at least the person or that situation. God's word possesses the power to change that. Does God's word dwell in you? Are you saturated and marinated in the scripture? situation arises, do you know a passage that speaks to that situation? When a problem arises and you don't know what to do, do you search God's word for what it has to say? How do we do this? Well, we use a tape measure when we want to measure a board to cut it to size. We measure twice, cut once. You know, that's the rule. We use a fixed standard to measure the board. Sometimes the measurement comes out differently. If it does, you don't throw away the tape measure and get a new one. <laughs> you realize that you did something wrong, not the tape measure. That's right. And then you fix your marks and you remeasure. The point is that the standard, the tape measure, didn't change. Hmm. God's word doesn't change. That's right. <clears throat> Learn to evaluate everything in your life by it. When life doesn't measure up, go back to God's word to find out what went wrong. This means that you must marinate in, in God's word, bathe in it, read it daily, memorize it regularly, keep it before you, print a, a, a verse and put it on your truck visor or, or on a mirror in the bathroom or, or on a wall in your office or someplace where you see it regularly, the, the refrigerator. It's not a good luck charm. It's not an open sesame kind of magic spell. It's a constant reminder of the truth that can break that rock hard situation. Christ is supreme, and, and Christ is enough are the two major themes of Colossians. And we ask ourselves then another question. Who cares? What does Colossians teach me about Christ? Christ holds the ultimate priority in everything. It matters not whether we acknowledge or recognize Christ's priority. He exists above all things, whether we recognize or acknowledge it. You ever met a person who thought they were God's gift to the world? <laughs> I met a few people like this, and when they talk to you, if they talk to you, they came down to your level because people like you couldn't possibly be as lofty as they are. They speak condescendingly, they patronize you, and I can't stand being around people like that. <laughs> Wonderful truth is that for as lofty and exalted as Christ is, he is not like that. Yes, Christ is the most important being that exists. Yes, Christ sits on a throne in heaven. Yes, Christ deserves all the respect and worship we could ever give. Yet, Christ does not sit in heaven as if he were aloof and disinterested. He doesn't patronize us. Chapter 1, verse 22 tells us that he came to us in the flesh. He lived a life just like you and me. He participated in the full range of human experience. He understands us. He wants to relate to each of us on a genuine and personal level. So what does this book have to say for the non-believer? Well, if you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, it's a very serious issue. Let's look for an answer in Paul's description of the non-believer. Chapter 1, verse 21 says that non-believers are alienated and enemies in God excludes non-believers from his special blessings of saving grace because they refuse to place their faith in his son. That's what it means to be hostile in mind. 
We read in chapter 3, verse 6, the consequence of unbelief, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience are anyone who does not place their faith in Christ. God's wrath against sin falls upon all who will not believe. God's wrath is eternal punishment for unbelief. And all who will not believe in Christ alone for salvation will experience this horrific wrath. There's good news in chapter 2, verse 14. Christ said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. I took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When Christ died on the cross, he opened the way for forgiveness. It was as if Christ took the list of our sins and rode across it, paid in full. Only Christ's death on the cross could satisfy God's <clears throat> All must, one, one must do to have their sin get debt canceled is to place their faith in Christ. You're here today and watching online. You place your faith in Christ right now. You feel free to ask questions of me and everyone else in this room. Scripture seek I have the opposite you see for the answers. What makes Colossians important for us as believers? I mentioned a few moments ago that we must marinate and obey the God's word. We must swim in it like a fish swims in the ocean. The Bible does offer answers to the problems we face on a daily basis. Some answers the Bible gives are only guidance for our responses. For example, the Bible doesn't tell you how to change a flat tire. It tells you about how to change your attitude about the time. <laughs> that being said, it is your Bible a little more than a telephone book or a dictionary or a spiritual encyclopedia. We use these reference books only when we need information. We use them to find out what the Bible says specifically for our particular situation. Let's take this one step further. Do you read your Bible for information or for relationship? So often we go to the Bible with this question, what would Jesus do? That kind of mindset. What would Jesus do? We, we know what Jesus would do for a particular situation. The answer to what, what would Jesus do is more simple than we might realize. He would seek fellowship with his heavenly Father. Why must we go to the Bible for our relationship with Christ? Well, Christ is first place in everything. That includes the scriptures. Christ is the king of the universe, the head of the church. He's also the very word of God. It's your first and foremost goal in God's word to know Christ better. Chapter 1, verse 10 tells us we ought to increase in the knowledge of God. This verse doesn't mean just in Bible truth. It means constantly increasing in our relationship with God. Your life will reveal whether Christ is someone you just tack on to your life when the chips are down, the going gets tough, when life hands you lemons, your faith will be revealed as genuine or fake. It's true or false. It's vital or innocent. Life will strip away all that isn't real and true. And what's left is what your relationship with Christ is really like. Make Christ your ultimate priority. Plan your life around him. Seek him in everything you do. Discover how he is king in that particular situation. Learn why he leads with mercy, love, and grace. How does Colossians impact our church? What does a letter to a church halfway around the world written almost 2,000 years ago have to say to us today in 2020? Well, Paul speaks of his pastoral ministry in chapter 1. He says, Whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you for, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to the saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom why that we may present every person perfect in Jesus Christ Paul said I preach I pastor so that I may present every person perfect in Christ that's the goal of every pastor's ministry 
And that's the church's goal. Amen. Our church exists to present everyone, to present every one of you that means two things at the same time. First, Christ is supreme, and secondly, Christ is more than enough. Verse 27 points us to the riches of glory. We gather to worship as a church because we believe that Christ is worthy to be worshipped above all else. Let me illustrate it this way. Let, let's say you have a choice between a dinner of table scraps served on a trash can lid or a full hot turkey dinner laid on Thanksgiving. Which would you choose? We always choose what we think is better. We gather on Sunday because we think Christ is the best, the most supreme, the greatest person that exists. That's why we encourage faithful attendance as often as possible. It's not so we can boost numbers, it's so that we, as a complete church, exalt Christ above all else. Hmm. We design our weeks so that we worship Christ on the first day of the week. We also gather because we believe Christ is more than enough. We, be, we come because we believe in the riches of glory in verse 27. Christ's riches aren't just barely enough to get us through the week. Like sometimes our paycheck, not too much month at the end of the check, at the end of the, the, the paycheck. And Christ's riches aren't just that we just barely cope with our situation. Christ's riches are lavish and extravagant. We sing songs about these riches. We pray our prayers for these riches. We teach and preach about these riches. Is that the way you look at this church? You consider the tremendous privilege you have to come to a church that preaches the gospel. Yeah. You value the relationships with others bought with the immense riches of Christ's wealth. Do you long for the times when we meet to worship? That should be how we view our church. What does Colossians have a message for our community? Look at chapter 1, verse 24. We now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind all of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul declared he was filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. It's a rather bold statement. What does it mean? Let's consider Christ's words to his disciples in John 15. He said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. They have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Christ promised the persecution would come on everyone who follows him. Mm -hmm. Look then at the beginning of chapter 1, verse 18. He, Christ, is the head of the body of the church. Christ and his church share permanent and imminent and intimate union. When Christians experience persecution, they, fu they fulfill the suffering of Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ suffered in his death so that he could identify with all who suffered his name. This persecution connects us with, in, in a tangible way with our Savior. When we suffer persecution, we share in his sufferings. And when family members ridicule or belittle you because you go to church, consider yourself privileged to participate in the fellowship of Christ's suffering. Mm -hmm. When you're overlooked for a promotion because of your commitment to Christ, be thankful that you suffer with Christ. If the Lord tarries, or unless he intervenes before long, we may lose the freedom we enjoy today, especially our right to break the worship freedom. I don't say this to discourage you. I say this so we may act accordingly right now. Let's not take for granted the privilege to the, the, free, the, uh, the freedom to worship. To gather on Sundays, Wednesdays, whenever we gather. It's one thing to say, well, if the government shuts our church doors tomorrow, we just need somewhere else to worship. And it's easy to have that kind of bravado when times are easy. How would you know that you would remain faithful when persecution comes? For faithful now, and make Christ our priority now, when the moment of truth comes, we won't waver in our decision. This is one reason why spiritual disciplines like daily Bible reading 
attending worship services and other Christian activities are, are important. And, you know, we do these things trusting that there's something greater than the here and now. And it's conveniences. Don't take these things for granted. There may come a time when we cannot do these things. We draw to a close. Every February, the NFL holds its annual Super Bowl. I think the Stanley Cup was that just a couple weeks ago now, but that just finished for hockey. October, baseball, World Series. The final game of the season determines the league's champion. I've been watching football for a long time, and I've never seen any team apologize for winning first place. <laughs> I, I've never heard an apology from the champion. It just happened. I've never seen the winners cry because they won. Certainly emotion, but never because they won. The champion takes first place, and that's that. Christ takes first place in everything. Yeah. He didn't do it by cheating. He didn't apologize for taking first place. He deserves to be saved. Augustine uh, once wrote, Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. Christ takes first place in everything. He takes first place in the, in the universe, in our church. He takes first place in our lives. There's nothing you can imagine or do exists outside of Christ's leadership and and when we value Christ above all else, we will love his word, we will love his church, we will love his people, we will love people. We won't try to make life work without him. We'll seek for him in everything. No matter how dark the situation. May the Lord give us the grace to be here. Let's pray. In the silence of the next few moments, I invite you to ask yourself. Is Christ truly the first place in my life? Allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to your hearts. that you and your son reign supreme. You created all. Without your sustaining power, we would not exist at this moment. You fill everything to the fullest, and we cannot live and move without existing in you. Thank you that you gave us your fullness in your son, Jesus Christ, that you made you pray. We ask for your Holy Spirit to teach the not believing soul here today watching online. Christ is supreme and worthy to be loved. May today be the day we finally acknowledge by faith that Christ is supreme. We ask forgiveness for us as believers. We say with our lips that Christ holds first place in our lives that when trouble comes we frantically try to make life work apart. Our thoughts, motives, attitudes, Emotions, words, and actions reveal how we are living by faith. Help us to realize the fullness of Christ and all that we have in Him. Help us to live by grace through faith, David. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we all stand on the turn to 163. When the morning gilds the sky, May we say the first and the fourth standards. The first and the fourth standards.
comes from 1 Peter, but the God of all grace who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 We'll meet over here in five minutes for our, for our